too many times we are withholding great. And so there's no joy in the day or the 90 minute practice. And it's because the leader hasn't said, here are four things that I know we're going to do today. We're going to play cutthroat without the dribble and eyes to rim. And as soon as we get all four players, because we're going to play four on four on four, that they square up ball and triple threat, feet pointed to the rim after the jump stop, but the eyes are pointed to the rim, you get a point. And that is great. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today, we are joined by the NBA assistant coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, Mike Dunlap. In more than 40 years of coaching, Coach Dunlap has experience at the D2, D1, overseas, and NBA levels. As the head coach at Metro State, he led the Roadrunners to two national championships in 2000 and 2002. After six years as an assistant coach at the D1 and NBA levels, he became the head coach of the Charlotte Bobcats in 2012. Coach Dunlap then led Loyola Marymount for six seasons and finished his career at his alma mater with 81 total wins which is fifth most all-time in program history. In 2020, Coach Dunlap was hired as an assistant coach by the Milwaukee Bucks and won his first championship when the Bucks defeated the Phoenix Suns in the 2021 NBA Finals. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. Hey, Matt. What's, what's up, Coach? How are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Uh, this is just an honor for me to to get to have you know, the, these minutes with you talking about hoops and leadership. Can't believe it. We, we could talk about you and Coach Bliss. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I knew him from uh, he was coaching the Jones Cup over in Taiwan, and we were chasing uh, Della Vadova when I was an assistant at Arizona. But anyway, um, yeah, that, that journey and all of that. I was out of Colorado at the time coaching a D2 school. and um, Metro State? He would, yeah, and he was friends with a high school coach there at Green Mountain. But um, nonetheless, it's, it, periodically he'd come in and, and speak at clinics. So in a, a previous lifetime, I had, had tracked him pretty hard, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, I thought the, the thread from you to – that whole experience, um, it's indelible. So oh. I, I, you know, I know that, you know, there's the over and there's the under, but probably piece by piece, your story is pretty harrowing in terms of what, you know, everything that transpired. So, you know, great empathy for you, but just also great courage by you to fight your way through that, to, to make some sense of, uh, of some things that just are really hard to put together. Wow. Thank you, Coach, for, yeah. for saying so, that. And I, yeah. I I loved I loved playing for Coach Bliss. I mean, yeah. he, he yep. was yep. he was an amazing teacher of the game. And yep. I think I thought he ran it's hard to, you know, it's interesting, I think, to say I, he ran our program well. But as far as the organization that we did have with preparing yep. for games and, and what we did on the yep. floor, yep. and no. he was the type of leader that I did enjoy did enjoy playing for and staying in that box. He was, he, you know, his centers of influence of who taught him and all that are none better. So <laughs> he knew exactly he knew exactly what to do uh, on that. And the other thing is, there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, sitting in judgment of that That's and right. how that can, how that silver bullet can hit you is to be naive to the fact that things happen to people. So yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I had a pl the pleasure of listening to you at a coach's clinic before, but then. Another reason why I'm so thrilled to do this is I think you're one of my favorite Twitter follows that I that I have. I think you use social media. <laughs> uh, you, you. I yep. mean it. I mean it because like some guy, some coaches out there use social media to share meaningful information that's going to hopefully help players, coaches, parents. And I got to ask you because even like yesterday, I was kind of like scrolling back through it, and I mean three or four different posts from you that are all just, they're, they're separate, they're insightful, 
and and the way that you communicate them too is interesting. The way that you fit all of that information in the hundred hundred twenty six characters, but where is that all that information coming from? You know, throughout the day that you're you're thinking of it at that point, and you're able to put it out there like that. Reading and then also interactions, and then the feed of uh, what's going on with Twitter in terms mm-hmm. of trends. So that keeps you relevant to the topic that people are interested in. And it could be off of a a bite. Uh, Also is that great authors and people that are current, like there's a very, very good writer um, right now going on with David Brooks and it's called The Second Mountain, but he's done a book on character and stuff and his own personal journey. And he's a scholar. And so he gets into topics which if you can weave them back to coaches and teachers and what's relevant for what's going on in players' lives today, you know, because it all trails back to parenting and centers of influence. And so I try to get to areas that are very difficult for coaches in particular, uh, staying in a 94 by 50, (laughs) uh, so that they, uh, understand that there's somebody out here uh, that there are a lot of people but that for me that I'm I'm in touch with their struggles and how to get across to young men and women uh, maybe a connector so that they can access somebody who does have the information I don't I don't you know I may not have the information but I try to point them to the information so that it's like parenting class until you go to parenting class and really put the time in, you, you don't realize that the greatest coaches out there are those instructors of parenting class, and they've done their 1200th class. Well, that means that let's say they have eight to 10 people in a class. Looping it back to that is, is that for 1200 times, 12 times 10, they've had to deal with a set of problems and then go through it to find the phase of the child, the formula that works of which I know nothing. I mean, you know, when you start out as a parent, you know, uh, you're not taken through classes. You're, you're actually extending the myth of how you were raised. And some of that is wrong. And so you have to, uh, you, you have to break the chain of what you were taught in order to be a better parent, coach, et cetera, or leader. And so I just think that accessing that information and passing it on, that is a level five leader to be a servant. Ultimately, our goal is to take information and empirically what we've learned and give it away for free of charge. And that's what I'm trying to do is just be a servant and then understand that I'm woefully uh, inept every day at doing that because that forces me to be better the next day. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is powered by Shoot360. The future of basketball has arrived in Dallas-Fort Worth. Shoot360 combines the latest sports technology with the fundamentals of basketball skill development. The result is a -a one-of-a-kind video game-like basketball program designed to improve your shooting, dribbling, and passing. Visit Shoot360DFW.com to learn more and register for your free one-hour workout evaluation. Shoot 360, the future of basketball is here. Based on how you you come about your information for the post that you, you put out, I would imagine your daily habits, you, you have a routine. I'm always fascinated with morning routines, daily routines. So what habits set you up for success? Um, there's an anachronism uh, out that was by a, a guy who wrote The Miracle Morning. And he got into a terrible accident, was in an ICU unit essentially for a year. And so he wrote uh, about touching all bases and he created an acronym. And the acronym is SAVERS. And basically it, cut, it touches all those mental and physical, spiritual, even emotional areas that you try to set the stage for. Um, In Green Lights, uh, they talk about, um, uh, you know, setting your day the night before. Everybody's different, but like what I try to do in Savers, number one is silence. And that is meaning to meditate. And you don't have to 
do it in a hokey way or a goofy way, but pick a time frame that works for you where you can actually reflect and think. Uh, uh, Mr. Rogers said that we have a noisy world. What are you doing to counter the noise in your life so that you actually take a minute, five minutes, 18 minutes to think about what you're going to do and how you want to do it and how you process information. So anyway, uh, I'm usually up sometimes at 3.30 in the morning or 4, right in that, that window. Um, and so I try to sit on the S and, and, and think. I, have a, I go to Google. There are over a 1,000 uh, meditative things that you can do where you can be led. And I happen to pick uh, one that's 18 minutes. So that's A, you know, for me, or S. And then A is affirmation. Think positive, talk positive. And finally, the most powerful is act positive. Your actions speak mm. for you. And so I, I, I go through a, a set of, for me, 10 of, of just over and over planting the seed of affirmations. I like the same affirmations. Some people like different affirmations. Some people connect it to religion. Some people don't. That's fine. Whatever doorway you, you have to walk through to plant the seed because there's so much negative in our lives. Uh, if you pay attention to the global plights of the world, mm. the, if you walk and you, you did that, well, then how are you going to cleanse yourself so that you can engage in people and be a source of energy? John Gordon, the energy bus, all of that stuff so that you have an aura of positivity because ultimately you have to compete against negative. And so affirmations are a great way to do that. V uh, on savers is visualization. I try to visualize how I'm going to move through a particular day and, and who I am and what I want to be. And if I don't have the image, how can anybody else have the image? So visualization and creating a picture. Can you create red when you close or your eyes? Can you create green or orange? A lot of people can't do that. And it just takes repetition. So visualization and seeing where you're going is so important. Then we go to E, exercise. So let's say you're on the couch, you're going through your savers, and you pop down and you do 10 push-ups. Well, that's 10 more than you would have done because exercise can be overwhelming for people. And a lot of people get hurt when they go from couch potatoes to a program. <laughs> and I think it's really important that little bites of the apple are important in a given day because there are profound questions in a person's life, why do I exist? What's my purpose? And I think that they're just these huge mountains. And David Brooks talks about it in his book, The Second Mountain, Chapter Three. He, he, he talks about um, graduate speakers. And here comes this guy or this young lady with a huge resume and it's sterling and it's from Harvard and it's they run their own company and they've done these remarkable things. And they're standing up there telling, let's say, 1,200 students. You know, be you, slay the world, live your dream. That's ridiculous. And I totally agree with him on that. Because if you're sitting there, you're scared to death. You don't know what you're going to do. And now you've got a speaker up there who's been there, done that. And they're going, okay, go ahead and climb Everest. Well, you know, Everest has climbed bit by bit in its preparation. So instead, I think it's really important that in your exercise, that you just do something and then it can work itself to something bigger and bolder and brighter. And that's the same thing. If I were going to speak at a graduation, it would be about what to do over the next month because yeah. I have three children. They all sat there for graduation and I know what it was like to be with them that night. And, and the pupils were as big as the moon. And they, you could just tell <laughs> they were like, Oh my God, now I have to be legitimate. I have to you know, work for a living. I have to do these things. It's more serious than four years of college, which we know is an expansive time in your life. It's trial and error. You get to, to not be accountable for your philosophy. You can say anything in English class and really not be in a hard way accountable in terms of the green stuff, money. How am I going to pay my bills? So anyway, exercise is a really important cathartic vehicle also to take care of your hardware. 
And because if you don't do it early and you try and get it late, you're in all kinds of trouble. So then we, you know, go uh, again, savor, S-A-V-E-R, reading. I am a voracious, eclectic, ADH reader, New Yorker, The Atlantic, David Brooks, uh, Outliers, and Gladwell. And then I'll go from Gladwell and I'll slalom all over the place. And I'm a, I'm not a, all right, let's sit down and just hammer out one book for three days and then go to the next. I like to pay attention to Twitter. I like to pay attention to Instagram because that gives me a pulse of youth. I mean, I'm not, you know, I want to know about Tinder. I want to know about all the social medium that's coming by 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds, because they're going to be there. And instead of condemning them for these mediums, yeah, I don't see them as agents of evil. I see them as something that has to be disciplined, like your phone. No phone zone at dinner is a good sound principle. You know, and I go through airports all the time and I see people with their head downs, not communicating. OK, now all of a sudden I cascade into negativity about look at all these people. Well, what I'm not doing, that's garbage. What I want to do is say, OK, that if that's the challenge, how do we move an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old to a place or even an adult where I say, hey, the phone's so cool. OK, and, and let's look at this. Because I don't want to set myself apart. And even if I want to be someone who's perceived as disciplined, I still want to be able to communicate with somebody that does something that I don't do. And then see if I have a collective responsibility to be the leader, how I could move them where I'm not turning them off before I actually want to discipline them. (laughs) I mean, you know, it's great to throw Listerine on somebody's head. But I don't know that that's going to, you know, leave you with being able to captivate an audience. You know, I, 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 and so anyway, getting back to topic and come back to earth with my point is, is that <laughs> if, if I like to read and I like to read a lot of different things and, and go forward and then l- use it a, as a piece of clay and then shape it into something beautiful. And then finally scribing, journaling. Uh, I have a journal behind me. I have my journal here in terms of my daily calendar. It works for me. I have a system, but being a, a writer to stay in shape because what writing does, and when you talk about the Twitter and the characters that you have to work, I don't know, it's 145 or whatever yeah, it is whatever now, it is, yeah. but that is like a haiku. And the great thing about trying to write a haiku is, is that you have a formula that you have to follow, five, seven, five. And then also is is that you have, you have to use the seasons in juxtaposition with each other. And you have to use oxymorons in a way where, as I say, more oxy than moron with me, more moron. But, (laughs) but my point is, is that you have to, uh, it, it makes you be disciplined with an articulation because in the pro level, in the NBA, economy of words is really important and they want to do and everything that uh, once they leave the building in 90 minutes, 120, uh, maybe they come back for some shooting, but they really want the basketball part of it because that's their existence and that's how they make money and that's how they survive. They don't want you to break into a speech on religion or morals or values. Now you can get there, but you have to enter there much later on the the platform of trust. Maybe a guy's Mm -hmm. having a trouble with his wife or kids or whatever, and they need an ear. And then maybe they'll ask you a question where you can impart some wisdom because you're like me, older, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, the anachronym is savers. It's how I, I did it this morning. I got up early and went downstairs. I'm in a hotel, went to the lobby and got everything set. Here's, you know, you got to live what you're talking about. Here it is. Yeah. And then I'm going to reach back here and grab my journal. Yeah. And these are just these books. And I put them in my backpack. I'm a backpack guy. And here's my <laughs> journal. And I open up my journal. And I flip through the pages and it's dated. And then I write little paragraphs, maybe five at the most. And uh, and then I keep these and throw these in a Tupperware box. 
And then if I need to go back to them, I have a record. I use a Franklin planner system that I, is my own that I've modified. And then if you tell people what you do, you start to overwhelm them. And then in this podcast, I'm trying to tell you everything in a short period of time. You lose your audience. But I'm also not going to dumb down. I'm not going to say, well, you know, I want to be Forrest Gump-like and, and be cute and witty. And then all of a sudden, I'm trying to be something I'm not in this podcast. I would rather be who I am and say, hey, you know, get a system of discipline. And when somebody says you get up at 3.30 in the morning or 4, I don't want to apologize for doing that. I don't want somebody to say, well, you know, I hear about sleep deprivation or whatever. I've been living this my entire life. And I tell my wife, don't be worried about my health or what I'm doing because I've been hitting this rock my entire life. And so I'm not going to modify or all of a sudden not enjoy a 16 to 18 hour day because somebody else isn't or some doctors telling me that, you know, ultimately sleep deprivation is going to kick my ass when I've been kicking its ass my whole life, you know, like, Hey, shut up. So, <laughs> you know, back to the anacronym of savers, it, 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 it works for me. It's called the miracle morning. I think it's by a guy named Elrod. You can look it up on Google, get the book. It's a short little pamphlet and it's dynamic. It's, it's wonderful. He has a great story about his life and how he survived a terrible crash and how he came upon savers. I use it. It works for me. There you go. <laughs> okay. So coach, that was, that was incredible. And I'm so thankful that you didn't hold anything back because I mean, the personal reason for starting this podcast is to get to sit across from someone like you and, and learn everything, not the dumbed down version. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. I, I have, I wrote down some questions while you were going through to ask, is that all right? Oh, it's awesome. And okay. you go wherever you want okay. and I'll do my best to answer them <laughs> in a shorter way than what I just did. <laughs> no, sir. I mean, I, you know, All right. uh, th I, I love it. Uh, three thirty to four o'clock. Yeah. Is that something natural for you? You've always been like that, able to get up early and then also always. what time you get into bed? Uh, always. And then, uh, the older I've gotten, the earlier I get into bed, but I don't have a program time. Sometimes okay. my wife wants to talk. And, and so I, I'll stay up later. We have friends here at the hotel. So we, we had dinner and then we stayed out and in the lobby actually and had a great conversation. Um, and, and, and it, it lasted, you know, I knew I was tired, but, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Sometimes in the NBA, you have film to do. And so you're up late and, mm -hmm. and, the, but I operate on about four hours of sleep wow. and that's just, that's who I am. Yeah. And then I, I love a nap. And so I'll take a 20 minute to 30 minute nap uh, in a given day and I'll just close my door to the office. I'll curl up in a corner. I don't care where I'm at. I can nod off quickly, oh, that's, get that 20 minutes that's and good. then come right back. And so I, you know, I like that. And I try to do that, in, you know, habitually and, and it works for me. But whatever works for anybody in terms of sleep patterns, I'm fine. I just, you know, some people obsess over it. And my point is, is that if the if if the wick is going to burn out because I did it that way, then let her burn. You know, I, I just I don't care. I you know, and that's everybody makes choices. I'll own my choice, and so I'm I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, the amount. Yeah, of so I'm up three thirty four. I wander around sometimes if it's. You know, I don't want to have a coffee before three, so sometimes I get up at two and I'll read for an hour. And I go back to sleep and I'll get up at five, you know, so it's it's a sliding scale in there and I feel it. But I immediately go to my phone mostly to read The New Yorker. And the New Yorker's hard read because they're long articles they are great writers. And now over the last two years, The New Yorker's made some of their writers shorten their articles. Thank God. <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I so uh, and and I think the New Yorker is delicious because of the talent of the writers, the content somebody can say in their uber conservative that, you know, that that that's a socialistic whatever. OK, fine. Then I'll slide over to the Wall Street Journal, you know, and read something from the Wall Street Journal. And then I'll go to the Washington Post or or whatever it is. You know, because what I'm looking for for me is content and style of writing. And then I'm looking for power words. If you read a book 
and you read the first sentence and the last sentence and you left the middle of the paragraph alone, you could pretty much get where the author is heading. This was all by being an English major. So my point is here is knowing how to read and dissecting and understanding what the author is trying to get across. I can pretty much skim and then go back if it interests me and dig into what they're writing. But if a book bores me in the first two chapters, I'm probably not going to read it. They've got it's their job to catch me. I don't have to catch that book. Oh, yeah. Page 155. And it started out. It's really good. At it'll really catch you. It'll really catch right. you. Three I'm, I'm of the way going, through. Hey, man, give your best <laughs> in the first two chapters. Don't don't be us around. Let's get to it. You know, and that's like if you're going to a clinic, you better come out there with big energy, snap them hard and go with what you've got and, and, and be, you know, interesting. You know, don't be nervous. Just give them your heart and go full. Hmm. I, I love the nugget that you gave about knowing, using social media to know other platforms and to connect with the youth. And I'm, I'm, I was thinking as a, you know, 40 year old coach that is already feeling the gap between me as a high school coach and, and what my you know players what will bridge are into. the gap. You know, it'll bridge the gap. Whomever your audience is, ask them who their heroes are basketball wise or outside that box. Because what happens when you turn 40, 35, 30, and it happens as fast as you're using Curry as your example. That's not relevant. To a 12 year old, they may have someone like Ja as their hero and Ja is vibrant and here he comes. He's an explosion in shoes. He's, you know, he's, he's a bouquet of, did he just say that? And you go, Oh my <laughs> God. But my point is, is that we all of a sudden date ourselves by the examples that we're using. All of us are guilty as charged. But what I try to do is stay relevant and Twitter allows you to see the trends of the language that the youth is using. Because when you piggyback on their language, you go, you can walk right into their heart. You can walk right mm -hmm. into their mind. They'll let you in. But you want to get irrelevant or start talking old school stuff. Old school is cool. But you have to wait and be more patient as you age to get there. That's all. It, they, they, they want truth. They want say as I do, not as I say kind of thing. I mean, they want you to do as you say. They want your actions because they've seen so much heartbreaking yeah. leadership that is behind the scenes, tippy-toeing around not living the life that they said purported, and it goes time and again. And I don't care what, you know, avenue, corporate or religion or yeah. whatever, you've got a lot of creeping going on. <laughs> and so yeah. Yeah. you just, you know, kids kids want a little bit of, of, of that authentic, you know, they want a lot of it, actually. But again, language is everything. Music. Kids love music. You don't have to say, hey, you know, I, that I'm, I'm this or I'm that. I really like that. You don't have to be fake about it. But if you can drop something, uh, you know, in terms of the latest and greatest for them, or you say, what kind of, who do you listen to? Let me have a piece of that. Okay. And now you say, what, what about that do you like? Then you're going to learn a lot about who they are when they say what they like. Or dislike. I'm not trying yeah, to you say, turn it, hey, I'm going to turn it back around to being about them, not about the genre, not about the artist and not about what their their political you know ideals are. It's you take it back to what it makes the kids feel and think. And like you said, it's a great door to walk through. But I think a lot of yeah. coaches and I'm guilty of it. I shut that door. I'm not interested. Well, here's, I don't want to know. Here's an example of the greats. Bill Parcells had a guy, um, Brian Cox, that he took when he was with the Jets. And and Brian had been irreverent towards other coaches. And 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 so he sits down and, and part of the story, which is in the book, Parcell's book, is he says, here's and then he stopped himself and he said, What's your hobby? And and Cox said, the ponies. And he said, oh, okay, I like the ponies too. 
all of a sudden Cox looks at him and then they get into this conversation about the ponies and A, B, and C. Well, he found a common object. They, they say, the psychologist says, when the child has been abused, never go directly at them. Go to the sandbox, sit in the other corner, and see how they move what item they're touching. Let's say they pick up a plastic shovel. At some point in time, you have to move yourself to that plastic shovel and start digging with them in the sandbox. And through that shovel, you will be able to get to the transgression, but you can't go to them directly. So the point of the communication is exactly what you said, Matt. Go to the genre, go to their interest, find something where it's neutral, not your power zone, not necessarily their power zone, but something where you can move to that you have something in common. Everybody must eat. It is primal. So a great thing to do is meet somewhere, not in your office, outside, that's neutral and bring some food, anything, you know, and it could be just straight candy there. You know, we, I've had a couple of players who just eat nothing but sweet tarts and Reese's and, and, you know, candy bars and stuff like that. Well, okay. Bring that to the conversation and say, Hey, I thought you might want this. And then it begins to open the door to where you want to head. It's simple. So you, it, yeah, you it's, nailed it. it. It's yeah, simple, yeah. but I think the goal, hopefully the goal of all of us is to be transformational. But then we, yes. because yes. basketball, uh, you, and I, I know you're the same way. I mean, we love it and we're competitive yes. and we want to be great and excellent at what we're doing. But it's so easy for it just to be all about that. I don't care what level you're at, all about basketball. But some, some of the simple tips you just gave are ways for us to open those doors to the communication that we want we i think deep down we want with them so i really appreciate you sharing that you bet how much time do you spend uh each day reading because I, I am trying to be a better reader but it's a time thing sometimes um you know i would tell anybody who is, doesn't consider themselves not you but a reader that um forget the clock read a page read a line of Twitter. Kind of like working then, out, just start, do something. Just start a little bit at a time and then bring them along. And then also is the other problem in terms of shutting the door to people who are not necessarily great readers or don't read a lot is find out their interest level of what interests them and go get that, that, that piece of material that, hey, I thought you would want this, and it's not your interest, and it's not didactic. It's more them, and then uh, you'll be able to. It's, it's like being in the wilderness, and you say, okay, what items do I need in order to start a fire? And, and they're, 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 those concepts and precepts are always the same. You know, in terms of just getting that spark you're going to need a, a certain kind of material if you don't have a lighter. Okay, what what can I do? What rocks can I use that will actually spark onto this dry grass? You can't do it with wet grass. So anyway, without going any further in that little visual, I think it's really important that uh, you say a little bit's good enough. I, I struggle. Good enough. I struggle at times. I'm, I'm reading through a book that I am interested in that I've chosen. And but then all of a sudden I'll read a paragraph, realize that I have no clue what I just read. I, my mind slipped, right. went somewhere else. Any right. tip? One, does that ever happen to you? Or any tips to staying more focused within it within your reading? Yeah, um, more focus is probably too harsh for me because <laughs> I usually bring crayons to any discussion. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, so. My point is, is that, that um, I'm forgiving on what I don't know, and I just keep going. You know, I think that it's too easy to set a book down, and I'll just skip it and just keep moving. And something down the road will bring me back to that. And I might not understand the whole paragraph, but it helps me understand the word. It's like if I don't know a word, then I Google it, and then I go to the definition. That may take more time. 
But then knowing that word, oh, I go, I got it. That word was a trigger that opened the door to my understanding. So it depends on the method and every, everybody's a little bit different, but I would, you know, definitely tell people, don't be so hard on yourself and, and move forward in the book, even skip chapters and then hit three chapters and, and tell somebody, whomever that is down the road. Yeah, no, I only read three chapters of it. I, he was a little or she was too uh, highfalutin for me. I didn't get it on me, but here's what I liked. And then that 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 takes you to a place and maybe that person shares with you uh, what their insights were and you've stolen <laughs> literally <laughs> an understanding because I think the understanding is more important than the fact that you don't understand certain things. The Jamoti podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. What's one of the best things that you feel like you've borrowed lately? The best thing I've borrowed lately, oh, definitely from David Brooks' book, uh, The Second Mountain. And he, the thing about Brooks that makes Sam brilliant is distinctions. And, you know, um, in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he uh, talks about good is the enemy of great. I cannot stand that quote. I think it is the most ridiculous quote I've ever heard, except for elites. Now, Vince Lombardi, all of a sudden, you, you know, people are extrapolating quotes out of him that makes him seem like he's a Neanderthal, but yet, he was a mathematician. He was a math teacher. This guy knew how to go from A to B to get you to C, okay? And so my point is, is that if you're starting your own program or you're starting with a young lady or a young man, young child on both sides of the aisle, it is imperative that good is your God. In other words, it. You just want to say, hey, when you're starting a bad program and you've had to do that, you don't want to give them at the end of the day, <laughs> good is the enemy of great. Are you kidding me? So now let's take, for example, you finished a game and you don't know that a game needs to fall into these buckets. A good win is you prepared for the win and your preparation paid off and you beat a better team, you know. Uh, a bad win is you prepared, you got ready, you're ready to roll, and an inferior team beat you because your team had a bad effort and they were disinterested. Okay, now we go to the other side of the aisle, and now we're looking at the bucket. We got two buckets, and it's a bad loss. We prepared, we were ready to go, and yet we got just absolutely gobsmacked in terms of we just got drilled. And, you know, we were, you know, we, there were, we didn't deserve to win and we got what we deserved, but we were lazy and let's say we didn't prepare. All right, there we go. That's a bad loss. No preparation and no effort. And now we have a good loss and a good loss to somebody who's never read Vince Lombardi. Say, hey, there's no such thing. There's yeah. no such, you know, such thing as second place. And the dad breaks the trophy, you know, and you go. No, because you're breaking the spirit of the child. Second place is the doorway to first. Good is the doorway to great. And so we'll bypass in an elitist way and talk about, you know, good is the enemy of great. And I've had that quote thrown at me at, at, at times, and I, I'm silent. But when I hear people use that and they don't know what they're saying, they're devastating their team because they haven't really reflected on, you know, words are powerful and they can break spirit. You have to be careful with what you say in front of your players. And you, you know, it err on the side of silence, err on the side of, I don't know, err on the side of, you know, cl you know, clarity. Hey, we're going to go from this in line to that in line. Here's the time. Okay. Now you see a kid who's a spastic, 
who is three seconds shy of that time. And now Macho Man is in there going, you know, that was an awful effort. You suck. You know, you'll never be anything. And, and it happens all the time. And yet I don't think you have to be Alibi Ike either. I just think you have to be very, very careful and say, hey, here's why that was good. And here's how to do better. All right. I'm going to help you with the first three steps. You took a negative step where the right foot went behind the left when I said, ready, set, go. All right. I'm going to have you lean forward and I'm going to have that right foot step six inches. Just do it for me here. And then I show them the five laws of learning. Tell them, show them, have them show you, correct the demonstration, Lord and master repetition. Bang, 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 bang. And so I'm going to show them how to take that positive step, show me in slow motion. No, you just took a negative step. All right, now take that right foot, step forward. Oh, man, that is awesome. Do it again. Do it again. And we've never even run yet. Okay, now you were at eight seconds at the other free throw line. Let's see if we can get you to 7.9. You know, all right, now I want you to take that positive step. Here they go. They run across that three-quarter line down the floor and the free throw line extended they clip it and it's seven seven make a big deal of that yeah that's a big deal yeah. but that yet you've got your studs that are doing that in four seconds five seconds you know and so my point is you have to assimilate and you have to adapt and understand it's not that you're gonna make an excuse that you know, that's okay in that way. But what you're doing is, is that in the NFL in particular, your best players are your offensive and defensive line. And there's, and lose a stud and find out why they're people that you absolutely need. You need great role players for your superstars to shine. And my point is this, is that that kid that you destroyed, you're going to eventually need them Maybe he or she's your fifth. Well, you better coach that fifth because if that fifth doesn't know how to set a screen properly or that fifth doesn't feel good about their role and what they're supposed to do, then you're not going to win a championship. And so my point is, is that too many times back to your question is I think that ignorance can destroy and you have to be very, very careful about what you're doing and how you do it, what you say to your young athletes. Yeah. A coaching buddy of mine says that awareness, self-awareness is a superpower, you know, act as a coach, really knowing where your team is at your program, your players, and not setting expectations that, how and you know from the level that you're at how many teams actually achieve great every year like it's really hard to do and you mentioned at the very Here, beginning here's the deal when you say that i'm going to interrupt go ahead and i say great is on the day great is on the day all right we do you know a plus b equals c and we may vie for a championship we may not but how many coaches are saying, okay, I'm going to give you a definition of great. And we'll go right back to that example. All right. And you say, ultimately, we have to hit that in line in this time as a group. We are a we. We are a team. And I'll look at the two best runners and I'll say, what have you ever done with Sally? What have you ever done with Jane? What have you ever taken any time whatsoever to get them across the line at a better time? Not me, you. And all of a sudden they go, well, no. Well, let's, let's, and I include myself with the we, let's help her get across that line a little bit quicker. And let's have a collective responsibility towards our weak link, so mm -hmm. to speak. And now yeah. you say, towards somebody that's going to help us win. And then you don't use weak link. In other words, you re-reference yourself. So the point you make about self-awareness and how to link in and get to great, too many times we are withholding great. And so there's no joy in the day or the 90 minute practice. And it's because the leader hasn't said, here are four things that I know we're going to do today. We're going to play cutthroat without the dribble and eyes to rim. And as soon as we get all four players, because we're going to play four on four on four, 
that they square up, ball and triple threat, feet pointed to the rim after the jump stop, but the eyes are pointed to the rim, you get a point. And that is great. Hmm. Now you're broken it down. They get a point, And now you say, hey, uh, we're going to do that. And the winner, you do it three consecutive times. You win the game of cutthroat. All of a sudden, somebody doesn't do it. You blow the whistle. They run to the end of the line. Defense goes to offense. And the other team runs on on high-hand closeouts. And here we go again. And now at the end, when you're reviewing the practice, you know, in cutthroat, we did this as a group. And your team won, your team won, and your team's going to win. Yeah. And all of a sudden, now they're rejoicing in something. When they walk away, they have to shower. They do whatever they're going to do in a given day. They're going to reflect and they go, hey, coach said we did something great today. And, and also, as you take a pregnant pause and you say, how does that feel? Yeah. How does that feel in there? And so, you know, I, I would say my saying is, is greatness is to be enjoyed on the day. But I think we have to do a better job of targeting it. So yeah, that defining, come defining. Back, that's clear right. Expe- clear expectations of how we arrive at great, and I, I, I that's, think that's really that's good. Right. I, when you were talking, right. I instantly thought about shot selection because I think yeah. shot selection is one of those things. Uh, like the word great, I, we just use vague terms, guys. We can't take bad shots right now. Only good shots right, right. now. Hey, that's a great shot. Eh, not that shot. That's a horrible shot. Right, you know, right. What? I mean, especially in high school, you got five dudes like little Timmy sitting there thinking, well, my my great shot is as soon as I cross half court, that clear, the clear uh, def- definitions of what different shots are so that we're all communicating on the same way because that that to me is where so much frustration comes from from players. So. I don't need to add to what you just said. Thank you. <laughs> really good really good i'm going to combine these two questions together what quality <laughs> or qualities do you see in great leaders and then who what leaders are you, do you follow closely there are so many qualities i think that people try to codify them but it's what you do not what you say ultimately Schwarzkopf, when desert storm was going on he was there He wasn't in the United States. So he put himself on site. And one of the little things that he did speaks volumes, which whether it's Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, maybe some of your great presidents of the past, one of the things they did is they put themselves in the back of the line in a chow hall. They don't eat first. And then they get in the back of the line and they start talking to some of the people that could be you know, picking up uh, boxes of rations and stacking them uh, and for distribution later on. And he would ask pregnant questions about what their responsibility was, when their birthday was, something that had to do with flesh and humanness. So number one on a boil down is that the leader is a servant and you can feel it, see it and know it. Number two is they have a set of values, you know, whether it's respect for time, but it's not do as I say, not as I do situation. Now, we all know that everybody has feet of clay, but we're just looking for some basics like Colin Powell. That was a man that was to be um, really everybody should talk to talk about his example as a man with grace, with serving the United States of America, uh, et cetera, is that I thought he was a special leader because he had a set of simple values. And you, and he, you felt safe with Colin Powell when he spoke, when you were around him. I had a good friend who was Assistant Secretary of Transportation under Skinner, and he would fly from D.C. to Alaska. He was from uh, where I was born, Fairbanks, Alaska, Wally Burnett. But anyway, he talked about sitting with Colin Powell and Ted Stevens when they take these junkets into Alaska. And that the fact is he was a a great listener, asked good questions, great listener. But the point is, is that it tethers itself back to respect. You know, they didn't have to show all their hardware, so to speak. And so they have a set of simple values. That would be number two. Number three is compassion. 
I'll leave it there, that you could tell that Mother Teresa was somebody that was a great leader, but she was compassionate. She devoted her whole life to others. And so when you see public servants, and you can say whatever you want about our current president, but the one thing you can't attack him on is that he's now past 50 years of serving in a public forum. And so my point is, I'm not selling the person, I'm selling the quality. And then that way it gets away from some, and I used him in particular because all of a sudden politics comes into the thinking and I'm saying, change your mindset, change the premise so you can change the outcome of the vision in your head. Just think about that. And then my question to them to get them back on their heels, if there's an, uh, and as I'll say, did you, have you tell me about your public service? And I'll say, it's only to get them to listen, not to change their opinion. I said, just settle down. And so the the point number three is that, that, that they all are, are servants in one capacity or another, whether it's the lions club, it could be, uh, they, you know, a, a church group where they, they're, they're connected to soup kitchen. I don't want to really hear about their interpretation of uh, some spiritual thing or the Bible. I'm more interested in the soup kitchen. That is spirit, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then I'll say, hallelujah. I don't care if it's Presbyterian or if it's, you know, a temple or, or whatever it is, a synagogue. I, it, it, it doesn't matter to me that I just want them to have a set of, of things that I can see. And they're really uh, tangible and I can feel them and touch them in terms of leadership. So those would be three things that are, are I think are pretty special as a leader. I think I've seen in, in just my experience, some leaders that whether it's my high school coach, you know, leaders that have those attributes, but then I was thinking about uh, uh, one as a leader, you know, uh, Gannon Baker said, you, you can't coach what you don't possess. Like we have, if I want my leaders at my, at, at my school, my players to possess those attributes, I better be showing those, you know, or right. else it's going to fall on deaf ears. But then I thought about my high school kids or and even college or, and even some pro athletes that how often is their view of leadership almost the exact opposite of those three things. You can't be compassionate as a leader. That's that's looked at as weak. You've got to be strong. You've got to be hard. You've got to be, you know, you got. I, so I'm wondering how how we can help communicate with our younger guys because that list of three that you said is powerful. But I think sometimes maybe through social media or what they see or who they're following, it doesn't always look that way. Yeah, we had a young man at LMU where I coached in a previous lifetime, and his name was Eli Scott. And he came for a particular background where you have hit the nail on the head as far as he saw certain things about me that that he interpreted as soft. And and he would be very, um, as a, he was 17 when he came to us, but he would be very direct uh, in a bully kind of way about how I was letting him down as mm-hmm. a head coach. And instead of rebuking him, I knew it was going to take time in order for him to become more tender and redefine him. And the community of LMU was going to have to raise, you know, it takes a village to raise somebody. And that, that, that the professors there, that um, the people that were the gardeners there, very special people. Um, Etc. The trainer that exposing him to a myriad of speakers and time, being patient with him, would redefine that. Because just because we know what leadership looks like and feels like, doesn't mean that our youth are going to get all that, or even like what we say at the beginning. And that's coaching: is to understand is that you're going to be lonely, you're going to be rebuked by your best players at times and that there will be transferable truths down the road. I mean, uh, that, that in many ways, that's what happened in Charlotte. I came in, I was very hard on a group. I put a high standard in and I coached the youth and there were some veterans that didn't like the way I did what I did. The voice got loud and I got fired. It's fine. 
you know, but I think that the work ethic needed to change. Some things were put into place that I was asked to do. I didn't like the taste of being fired, but I understood that we won three more times games than the previous team had done. And we needed to probably win 28 to 32 in order for me to survive <clears throat> on a number because that's the pro life. But my point is, is that, and I could have been a lot better as a coach in a lot of other ways. But my point is on leadership and understanding your audience, sometimes you're going to do things as a coach that are going to be punishing to you in that chair of right. leadership where you're just flat out lonely, but you down in your heart, you know that when you're not playing a player who's repeatedly late, that it could cost you. And the guy with the Rolex who writes big checks is going to be upset with you because he doesn't, well, you're a hard ass or you're old school or you're whatever, but he wasn't there day in and day out and understood that this young man's life or young lady's life depends upon that lesson, mm -hmm. depends upon that lesson to say, no, it means no. and there are consequences for actions. And all of a sudden, we end up being soup and we're, you know, want to be perceived by the guy with the Rolex as a, a, a man for all seasons, a coach that can get along. And yet, you know that you're going to shortcut it. And that young man or that young lady is ultimately going to get a DUI because they felt that they could break the rules and get away with it. That it doesn't work. And yet that's why your teachers in kindergarten are so important. Mm -hmm. And we're so skewed in the money we pay them. We should be paying them more money than we pay a professor. No question about it, because you're talking about the beginning. Yeah, the basics. And those people, yeah. that's yeah. right. And they have to be very talented to access the child in order that they go from one step lockstep to another to understand what no means, what yes means, how learning evolves. It, it goes into a, a whole host of things and I'm getting up on a soapbox. I'll get off of it right now. <laughs> but my, my point is, you know, on leadership, the most powerful thing I say is that evaluate, if you're a coach, your own behavior. You know, on one end, um, there was a certain coach who's in the Hall of Fame. But when we and he ran academies and I, I went and I listened to him speak a lot and he had beautiful information, but there is no way I would ever go to this man for discipline because he couldn't discipline himself and he was abusive towards his players and he was abusive towards his son who played for him. And I'm watching him and I'm going, are you kidding me? You are talking about discipline and, and in front of an academy of 400 coaches and you're the most undisciplined person I've ever seen on how you treat officials, how you treat your own players, how when you don't get your way, you explode in your walking time bomb. And so my point is, we have to be very, very careful about saying that when we're going to get information, that we can go get it from the worst person, so to speak, and take out that chip that's very good without denigrating that person who is undisciplined. In other words, I think it's really, really important when you get back to being a coach that you understand that everybody's going to watch what you do and they're going to know your weaknesses and you have to understand that and accept that. That's why if you say you're going to be on time, then be the gym first to turn the lights on, mop the floor, do whatever and get right in there with your managers because the day that you start showing up and you know the assistants got the players ready and it's all of that is the day that you're going to fall over in this the the sight line of a couple of your players they're going to see it thank you for those reminders right there what are some coaches and leaders that you just personally follow closely you you love to listen to them uh, read up what they're doing well, I, I always think that Brad Stevens in the NBA is somebody to follow because uh, he has a sideline decorum when he was a coach that was second to none. 
Hmm. And you always knew that he had high emotional intelligence and he was under control. Number two is whenever he spoke, you knew he was smart. He would drop pearls left, right, and center. And he, three is he served uh, the coaches well because if you ask him a specific question, he had no secrets. Where there are a lot of coaches that think that they have secrets, closed practices, uh, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, Dude, you have no secrets. Stop all this nonsense. But Brad Stevens, as a coach, is somebody who I thought um, and think uh, is very special. I work for a very special man and, and, and Coach Budenholzer. Not only did he wait 19 years to be the head coach of the Atlanta Hawks, he was with Popovich. And if you really want to be great at anything that you do, or at least good, <laughs> is that you, the selections that you make with your friends and the people that you choose to be around is everything in a statement. In mm -hmm. other words, it doesn't mean you ignore people that don't exactly have your values, but you move or transition away from them in a reasonably amount uh, of time so that you can, you, you, you know, you can get to the people that not only you love, but also the people that can teach you things. And so I think that, you know, as a as a writer, I don't think there is a, 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 you know, somebody Jim Collins. I followed him. I found him. I listened to him speak to 32 superintendents in Denver, Colorado. I chased him down because I thought that as a leader, he understood leaders and he was that kind of leader. So I'm weird, but I think Jim Collins deserves to be on that level. David Brooks is somebody who was uber conservative, who has moved his sight line and his heart to a place where he can talk to both sides of the aisle when he writes. So mm -hmm. I think he's somebody that I like to listen to. Malcolm Gladwell, massive amounts of information and research. He can condense it. So somebody like me, who still has a kindergarten understanding of <laughs> high, you know, highfalutin concepts, uh, I, you know, so I'm weird. Colin Powell, as I mentioned, yeah. I, I, anything I can get my hands on, uh, that, that I've read a, a lot of him. I think he's, he's special, but I would suggest this to people that military people and especially leadership, the one criteria that is, is not refutable is the fact that their training thousands of people to have a condition response in the most abject situations where life and death is at stake. Okay. Now there are certain people out there listening that will hate that as an example to go to the military, to glean certain information, but the most information you can get on human behavior is in the annals of the military because they have to take the most amount of people and get them to act a certain way. And yeah. so there's a certain methodology to that. It doesn't have to be life or death in your training, yeah. but there are certain beauties that you want to steal from that human behavior. Okay, now you don't like that? I met a guy who did dry needling in Eugene, Oregon. And there are two renowned back surgeons, one out of Canada and one out of the United States. And these people, both surgeons, would go to massive amounts of information. Ah, the military, injury. Okay, what are they doing with backs? And they found out that when back surgery is done, you do not want to damage the fascia when you go in and you cut. And so hence the cuts now on back surgery and shoulder surgery and knees now are through these tiny cuts to save the fascia, which is a pulley system, and I could go on and on. Well, he invited me to listen to the Canadian doctor talk to all of these trainers in Eugene who are dealing with these brilliant runners in injury. And so I said, heck, yeah, I'd love to go because I was there as somebody who didn't belong in the room, just as I didn't belong <laughs> in the room with Jim Collins. <laughs> but I'm over there with my little yellow pad taking notes on common denominators that are applicable to coaching. Because I oh. wanted to know about the medical end. So when a player came to me and said, hey, I tore my ACL. And this is the important information on ACLs for people that are out there. You can get it anywhere now. 
but somebody that's out there that tore their ACL, say it's Joe Ingles at Utah, who's now going to be with the Bucks, they know the math on a retear of the ACL from somebody that's going to get to the hardwood from six to eight months, eight months to 12 months, and 12 months to 16 months. They can say that being patient and bringing them to the hardwood, regardless of what the trainers have done, and now there's no atrophy in the quad, for example, which is your brake system. And I'll stop myself there. But my point is that I want to know when I'm a coach, when it's safe to put that player on the floor from an ACL, uh, an ACL tear. And I'm weird that way. But my point is, is that it's really important in terms of leadership when you bring yourself back and you're making these picks that you don't pick one type of leader, like example given, the cooking channel. Guy Fayetti, that guy is hilarious. One, two is, is that he will make mistakes or make fun of himself. He's self-deprecating. But three is he's really smart because He's dealing with a cross section of how to cook hamburgers or how to cook a, a fancy meal. And he's out there. And I don't know how long he's been going on the cooking channel because a lot of them, whether it's Emerald or this guy or that guy, they drop off because they find their own kingdom. But, you know, he has stood the test of time. Leadership has that leader stood the test of scrutiny and time. John Wooden, Pete Newell. Oh, my God. You want to talk about great leaders? Those two guys are Mount Rushmore. Different style. But when I look at great coaches, you cannot leave Pete Newell off that list. Now you go to Red Arback and you say, Bill Russell had a certain intelligence, was 160, 170 IQ. Bill Russell, you could not trick him to what racism was. He said, I love being a Celtic, but I didn't love the Celtic fans. Why? This is what I heard they said to the opponents. This is what they said to me. But he said, I love my coach and I love my teammates. And that's why I stayed with them. Because somebody said, you were in the bastion of a very tough community. We'll put it that way. Because somebody that's not that way that goes to a Celtic game will say, oh, you call me a racist. No, no. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you know, that's not what I'm, the point I'm making. I'm saying that Red Arback must have been doing something in his way where Bill Russell said, you know what? I love you and I'll play for this team because you're a leader that gets me. Um, you're of Jewish descent. And so we both have been treated in a certain way in society where maybe I'm guessing that there was this commonality between the two. But my point is back to, to leadership. I didn't want to leave Wooden alone. I didn't want to leave Newell alone. But I, then I, I do think you have to go to Martin Luther King. I do think you have to talk about Gandhi. I do think that uh, Mandela, and you saw his arduous journey becoming a great leader before he passed away, is that, all right, give me, somebody else who has that that story and i mean it's you know those those people are to be looked at and admired in 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 a in the most positive way but mother teresa oh my god i mean she, it, her journey and what she did uh you know totally humbling you know so those are people that that just jump out to me i got to ask this because i i'm probably like majority of, of of basketball fans sports fans that we just get to watch these players and we see whatever they allow us to see on twitter we see them at, at games and maybe in a press conference but in your opinion what makes Giannis such a special leader because to uh, outsiders i love listening to the way he deflects praise back to the team and, and but but you get to kind of be around him in a different way you know and what is he like as a leader? Well, the most, the most, the best thing I can say about him for everybody that's listening is manners. As a coach, we all have to inculcate on our players a set of manners. It's important, for example, that you open a door for other people. Some people would say open the door for a young lady. Or older lady, 
whatever. I just say that there's to have manners that Giannis has. He has a set of manners. I have never, ever seen him go into any arena, home or away, and warm up and not finish his warm up by shaking the hand of every ball boy or girl that's under the basket. Wow. He has a set of humility and 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 sincerity, which the gateway are his manners. And he will get up out of a chair for anybody, male or female, and offer a chair. He will come to our table when we break bread on the road as a team over to the where the assistants and the head coach sit. And we do mingle and all of that. But if there's food left over, he'll ask if we're going to eat that food. And then if it's something that the players like, they'll bring it over and, and give it to our trainer or give it to other players or whatever. And it's a habit. You are your habits. And so he has a set of manners. He has a set of humility, uh, which are these little connectors, I call them, that he does where, and I, you know, you don't go to, to bed in silk pajamas and become a tough guy. In other words, he had a very, very difficult life. It's out on a movie, but, you know, the movies really don't get to the life he lived. And they were in a 400 square, square foot apartment. There were seven of them total. Hmm. And he had to go sell sunglasses along with two of his older brothers on the street. And when you do that for three years and you know that there's the income will feed your family and do all of these other things in a ripple effect. What happens when you're dealing with a lot of people and you're trying to sell something, there's a bottom line, is that you learn about people. And the thing that I would say about Giannis is when you rep it out like that for three years, you understand human nature. And at a young age, I think he really understood how to make people smile. You know, there is an end game for all of us. But humor is the gateway to a person's heart. And when you can make a person laugh and kind of get rid of their problems for a second and do these things, he is hilarious. <laughs> and so the other quality, I mean, here he is telling dad jokes. They're the worst jokes in the entire <laughs> world. And he's making the entire press corps laugh joke after joke because you have something that's unpredictable in a very sincere and humble way like you said he's a great deflector and it's the only reason why he stayed in a small market mm -hmm. he he could have made a lot more money but he understood that he had his family together in a community that loved him in a home chicken soup kind of way it was hey we don't have filet mignon in this community but what we do is have real people that love you that are going to come to the games and, and Pendleton's not everybody, but my point is the masses that are out there that are at a cafe, you know, that, that, that Uber, that, that may Uber them from the airport. These are folks that he knows really, really care for him. Mm -hmm. And he can get that <clears throat> right away in Milwaukee, whereas maybe in LA, New York, Miami, you're not going to get quite, uh, the diversification of audience is what I would call it. Coaches, the Jamoti podcast is powered by Biology. What's your BSA score? The Biology Skills Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NAIA, NJCAA, and a growing number of NCAA coaches to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This four minute, 40 shot test can be taken free today on the Biology mobile app. Elevate your game. Last question, though, 42 years of coaching, uh, what would you do differently if you could start over? Number one is have a, more patience and a deeper understanding of, of going and getting information before I move the group to a certain point. I didn't get enough information. How do you do that if you're a coach out there? Create your own I am sheet, three pages, ask their favorite food, ask the worst tragedy they've ever dealt with ask their favorite color, their favorite musician, the one book they would take to the moon, uh, ask them that if they were the president of the United States, give us two things that you would do to help America. Um, so now you're connecting them to a bigger picture. But 
create three pages of your own of questions and t- give it to them before you start the journey of the coaching because wow. you're going to get more information than you could get in 10 years if you didn't give them that form. And so I think uh, that the thing I learned was to do that earlier and listen more, say less big statements about what your culture is. Uh, you know, I'm really rebuke uh, this this thing on culture. It's gotten insane and we use it as a shield. Yeah, I, and sorry yeah, to I, interrupt. I'm more into, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I had oh a co- I had a long t- long time a, a <laughs> varsity head coach in this. I'm in D- Dallas Fort Worth in this area. Just retire, and we and I had a I had him on, and I asked him about culture. He said, "You know what? That word. He's like 10, 15, 20 years ago, we never used that word. It was just <laughs> it's just who we are and what we did every day. So, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm and my thing is that just have a standard of a, a simple day." An expectation that's clear, and then if it's really done well that day, then it's going to perpetuate itself to the next day. If it's done sloppy, whether it's food, whether it's time, whether it's teaching and how you teach, whether it's respect and how you deal with your superiors, then it's going to be done poorly the next day. And so, only worry about one day when it's relevant to culture. Okay. Um, so the second thing would be I, I would delegate more. Hmm. because delegation is a form of trust. So third is I would go to a parenting class when I had the dream of being a coach, because going to a parenting class is connecting you to human behavior. I don't care if it was Newell Cheney, uh, um, uh, even Wooden, which uh, Pat Riley, none of them know as much as a director of a parenting class. They don't. And these people, and especially an old one who has done this, because what you're doing is when you go to a parenting class, you're learning about human behavior at its inception and the phases of we have a particular player on our team now who has a fairness issue with officials and he's mm-hmm. always griping with the officials and he's really bright. But somewhere in the phase, your kid from five to seven goes through where it comes out of their mouth and it's in that time frame. That's not fair. That's not fair. As you will get a young child who will say, I'm bored, I'm bored. And it's imperative when you go to parenting class. Well, what? I mean, yeah, I hear that. Well, what do I do? And we do so many wrong things to deal with the word bored because the child is testing you and immediately you say, I hear you're bored. Yes. And I don't want to do that. Oh, well, you don't want to do that or you're bored. Ah, you know, and so (laughs) my point is it's smoke in my eyes. Now you say, okay, well, uh, Holt, we had our eldest son, his name Holt. Well, Holt, you're in charge of your own entertainment. I'm not. And now those crayons were there three days ago and you were playing with them. Make them work. Make them work. You know, and then all of a sudden you say, can I suggest something to you about making those crayons more interesting? Hold, you know, yeah, dad, yeah. And I go three days from now, I'm going to show you what that is. But for today, make that work. See what you can do with them. Do something different with them. I got to go over here and do this. And that is Frederick Jones. Praise, prompt, leave. I said, hey, you were really good with those crayons yesterday. Now see what you can do with them today that's different and then walk away. And now all of a sudden they don't have you in the gotcha game, you know, and now you're in charge of juggling and being with them and exhausting yourself with your kids. Because I've heard dad say this all the time. Oh, I'm so exhausted. Where's mom? Well, it's because they have no skill set. And my (laughs) point is, as a coach. I would go to parenting class ASAP. I wouldn't read a book. I wouldn't talk to Newell. I wouldn't talk to to Wooden. First, I would go to a parenting class. That's how important I think that is to the evolution of a coach and understanding what you're inheriting when certain words are used and a player is complaining and hard to deal with. (laughs) Anybody can deal with somebody that's got great behavior. But when you deal with somebody that's persnickety or they've got all these problems, 
Number three is get out there and every time you're in a room, think you're the dumbest person in the room. Because they say when you go to dinner with people that you know are way smarter than you, the first sign of your intelligence is never to speak. In other words, just ask questions, take notes. But if you're with people that are all scientists, I'm not going in there telling them a thing about the moon, but I'm going to ask them a lot of questions because really smart people keep asking questions because they're curious. That's just one of those common denominators. So as a coach, I would ask a lot more questions than telling people A, B, and C. And that's a good start for that question. And I'll leave it there. I do want to get to the speed round. Uh, Let's go. Small questions. First thing that pops in your head, coach. Favorite ice cream flavor? Coffee. Nice. Nice. Uh, How? Okay. I kind of know this, but how many hours of sleep do you need? Four. Best basketball movie of all time? I, I would say, let's come back to it. Okay. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock. Texting or talking? Talking. Favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. Can't wait to hear this answer from you. In basketball, who is the GOAT? As a player? Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Greatest of all time? Michael Michael Jordan. If you want me to edit that out, I want you to get in trouble with any any other players. No, no, no. (laughs) No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm good because uh, okay. his, his, his book is done. Now uh, there are others coming up the river and assail that. Okay. But um, it's a pound for pound answer too, and yeah. and I want to say that. But if you said really press me, and we we went, you know, away from all the ESPN, you know, timelines and all yep. that, it would be Bill Bill Russell. Okay, I'm a big big bill russell and then i think that uh, jabbar has a real case mm-hmm. for for in that that conversation but you know immediate all my reflection and stuff like that uh mj yep if, pound for pound no one like him if you could travel back in time what period would you visit tomorrow coach i've done about i've done around 100 of these i've, I've never had an answer like that that's a, that that's yeah. good that's good. And then um, the, the the favorite uh, basketball movie. I'm going to hold on to that. I think some people are really disturbed by the fact that they don't have a clear answer. You know, because I think it's easy to you know go to Hoosiers right, or do this right. or that. But I'm not. I'm not going to do that. And I have a a, a, a different answer in terms of um, favorite basketball movie. If I picked one person for my life uh, and made it a movie, it would be John Chaney. I had never, I've never met a man like John Chaney. I've never, ever seen, and I watched, wouldn't do uh, practice. I was with uh, Coach Newell for 20 years in his big man camp and all these other things as references. I I was at, I saw Pat Riley do his first practice at LMU because I was the graduate assistant who opened up the door for the Lakers to get into the little alumni gym where they practice. And I watched him do a ton of practices before he closed his practice, et cetera, et cetera. And he's very, very, very good. Uh, But John Chaney was Maya Angelou when he taught. And the way he taught, he was poetry in motion. And I had never seen, uh, I was a part whole guy. And then you go, people learn by whole part whole but Newell was part whole but I'd never seen anybody have his players warmed up and do guard forward work with Jim Maloney and Dean Thamopoulos were either in guards down there Dean had the bigs and Jim Maloney had the guards and they go a half hour and then everything was five on five from that point forward and any turnover he would say let's reenact the crime he would rewind the turnover and he would show them at first he'd ask he'd ask the player what the hell were you thinking and then the player would say hey i threw the body ball from my right shoulder across the split line to the the far the wing cutting across and he said 
We never do that in our program, and here's why. And then he would go into a, 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 an example, a metaphor, a description of crossing the street, looking uh, down a one-way street both ways, and he would tell them why. And all of a sudden, you know, he had these descriptions, and they were, he always dealt with some, some young men that were hard to deal with. And the way that he moved them to how he wanted them to win was incredible. And I had never seen basketball taught that way. I'd never heard someone speak that way. And then at the end of practice, he would pull you in. Anybody who's ever been into, you know, was in his, the, his office, he had oranges, a bag of oranges. He had two. The, the video guy would come in and put a pro game on if they recorded it and he'd have a college game, he had two TVs going and he'd be talking to you. He'd take a pin, a big pin, and he would stab it in the navel of the orange. And then he would take it and squeeze it into his mouth. And at the same time, he showed you how to stick the pin in there, core it so you could get all the juice out of the orange. And he said, now you try. And then if you spent that morning with them, and he'd say, hey, come with me. And he'd have this little cooler. Anybody knows this true. And he had peanuts in a cooler with a couple beers. And he would meet with the same professors and they would play tennis. After they played tennis, they would sit on the poles and, and where it was. He put his back up against the pole, open the cooler, and they would sit there and crack peanuts and, you know, sip a beer and talk about life, about philosophy, about the news that day. And you were with them and you realized that you had gone into somebody's home and they had apple pie. They had maybe a roast that they cooked with potatoes. And you had people that showed up at the table with tattered clothes that would pray, would sit there and converse and laugh and cry. And you were you were in the presence of greatness. And, and I, but there was a humanness to him that I had never been exposed to, you know, and I'm not, this is not a criticism, but Riley couldn't do that. Wooden didn't do that. Wooden was homespun, but it just wasn't his way to go to that depth to say, Hey, you know, this is really what, what I'm feeling. Uh, it's not a criticism. All of them, none of them were quite as homespun and connected to the flesh and the marrow as Cheney was. And so I give you that, that I, I think it would be one practice, um, so you don't have to come back this way, of John Cheney running a practice, and it would be the best, best movie I ever saw. That's there awesome. you go. That's awesome. Yeah. Coach, I just want to thank you so much for you know giving up your time this morning being so open sharing so much and giving back to coaches and it, it just an unbelievable experience for me well i too am humbled by the fact that you asked me uh to do this it's an honor and um you know it, you've made my day and i don't have to have anything ahead of me to have the best best day today because of the privilege of of doing this now and sharing and doing it in a really inept way you know i i wish i were better already but i'm not going to suffer fool's thoughts because it was the best i could do and so i it's just you know the rest of whatever's ahead of me now is platformed by this which is pure joy and because you had thought through your questions, you've done this a million times. And also is that it was important to me to know a little bit, a tiny, a scintilla of your journey. And I love where you came from and how you addressed your ba Baylor experience. True? Yes, sir. And the way, yeah. yeah, and the way you see it is the way that I hope I see everything. So, you know. And God sometimes bless it you takes, and sometimes and it takes you. a little time to be able to to see because in the moment, oh, yeah. in the storm, <laughs> you're in the storm, you don't you don't see the positives. And then just no. to, not to take too much, but when yeah. 
you know, uh, two years ago now or a year and a half ago when when Coach Drew and yep. the, the, the Baylor Bears are beating Gonzaga and national champions, I get to sit there holding my wife's hand thinking I am a small, small part of that. And, and that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's the best feeling. And so <clears throat> back at you, Matt, well, and, and uh, good luck with everything and, and stay healthy and have fun. Yes, sir. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.